Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is the Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, the Conservative Leadership Series concludes with my sit-down interview with leadership candidate Leslie Lewis about identity politics, net zero, and the road to a Conservative victory. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Hello and welcome. This is another edition of Canada's Most Irreverent Talk Show. You're tuned into The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. As we've been doing the last six weeks now, we are doing in-depth conversations with Conservative leadership candidates that run the gamut. We talk about their policies, the state of Canadian politics, a few curveballs here and there. And the goal is to really get a sense of who these candidates are. Remember, they're not just seeking to lead the Conservatives, but they're also seeking to lead the country. So we've been doing this series. We've gone through five of the six candidates so far. And today we have the final installment of this series, my sit down with Leslin Lewis. Now, I've spoken to Leslin Lewis in the past, so it's not my first time speaking to her, even in the campaign. I, I did an interview not long after she launched. Also caught up with her in Ottawa for the Freedom Convoy. And again, Again, very briefly after the unofficial first conservative leadership debate put on by the Canada Strong and Free Network. But this is a lengthier discussion. As you'll see, we cover a number of different things that she's touched on in her campaigns and others that conservative members and prospective conservative voters have shared with us as being questions that they have. And here is my interview with conservative leadership candidate Leslin Lewis. Haldeman Norfolk Member of Parliament, Leslie Lewis. Dr. Lewis, good to speak to you. Thanks for doing this. Nice to be back with you, Andrew, and in person this time. Yes, yes. Always yeah. a pleasure to, uh, to speak to you in person. Mm -hmm. When I last interviewed you in person, it was briefly after the debate, uh, the Canada Strong and Free Network conference debate in Ottawa, which was the first debate of this race. And, and now, obviously, we've had a few more months of campaigning and the membership cutoff is locked in. What's your sense of this race overall, especially as for you, it's a second time running compared to last time around, how are you feeling? So, well, last time around, you know that I won the popular vote on the second ballot. I, my numbers are much stronger this time. I see that the support for me is much stronger this time. It's a little bit bewildering because the media has not even recognized that. I mean, you have in, in, to some respect and, and so has um, conservative media, but the media in general has not really recognized the fact that I'm really the only candidate that has a proven track record in a federal conservative leadership race. And it was a very strong track record, but yet they, really, really view me as an invisible person. And I'm getting a lot of support uh, from the membership base who are recognizing just how biased the legacy media in general, the pundits are. Going into the 2020 leadership race, I, I think you were a relative political unknown. I know you would run as a, a candidate in, in Scarborough, but now you've come at it as someone with national profile. But after the last leadership race, I think a lot of people really thought you were going to have a very strong role in the Conservative Party of Canada. Certainly Aaron O'Toole had, had indicated that, but you were not even given a, a shadow cabinet role after the 2021 election. Did you feel directly sidelined? Well, I think, to be honest with you, Aaron wanted to give me a shadow cabinet position, but he had a policy that everybody at that time had to divulge their vaccination status. And I was very adamant that I believed that the vaccine uh, mandates and COVID was being used to uh, create division and to really create segregation within our society. And I was very adamant that, that medical privacy is something that's very, very important because I was afraid of what was going to happen, how we were going to use it mm -hmm. as a political wedge. And I was right. It, it did happen. And so I stood up for that. And um, Aaron was honest with me. He said, y you, you'll have to divulge to get the shadow cabinet position. And um, he really wanted to give it to me. But I said, no, this is a stance that I, I have to take. And he understood. When you talk about this invisibility that you feel to the mainstream media in the current race, what do you think is the source of that? Do you think it's that you are someone who's talking about vaccine mandates? Do you think it's because you're pro-life? Well, why do you think you are taking on that, that status of, of being invisible in your words? Well, no, because someone like Roman Babar gave up his career. He took a very, very, very harsh stance mm -hmm. um, and t paid a price uh, for vaccine mandates. So I don't think it's necessarily that. I think it's because I don't fit the narrative, the left-leaning narrative of what a black woman should be. 
and they want me to be um, a victim. Um, they've created this entire critical uh, race narrative where they define everybody in terms of their race and you have to fit within a certain box. I don't fit within that box. I refuse to see a little white six-year-old child and label that child as an oppressor, nor do I want anybody labeling my children as victims and I'm not a victim. So when you can create a narrative that people of color are victims, then you can render them invisible. And that's exactly what the media has done. If you look at what happened recently when Patrick Brown got kicked out of the race, it was preposterous that people were saying, oh, who are visible minorities going to vote for? Because they had rendered me completely invisible. And it's because of this woke cancel culture narrative that we have bought into, whereby we, if everybody doesn't agree, if everybody doesn't agree on abortion or pro-life, you label them, you demonize them, you create a political wedge, you get them to fight against each other. And that's how politicians keep us divided. I've taken a different approach. I've said, I don't want to be a regular politician where I'm gonna dodge from the question. This is who I am, this is what I believe. I don't necessarily believe that you have to have the same beliefs as me. In fact, I welcome you to have a different perspective than I have. If you take ex for the example of abortion, I am working with pro-choice people right now on dealing with the issue of females being rendered less than boys in the womb. I'm dealing with that because we see, we've seen that China and India has put in laws to make sure that they're, that um, female aborting female babies in, um, is, is not a, a practice anymore. Mm -hmm. And those countries have dealt with that problem because there was a problem. And now the only two countries that are left that allow you to have an abortion only because you're a girl are Canada and North Korea. So we're seeing a tourist industry here in Canada. And so pro-life people and pro-choice people have united and said, yes, we will unite together in fighting misogyny because we believe that baby girls are equal to baby boys. That is something that we can do in forming common ground, but we can never get there if we demonize each other and if we assume that just because we have different perspectives, we can't agree on anything. And so that's, that's what I'm trying to put forth, is that type of leadership. I want to go back to the identity politics comment you made at the beginning of that response, because you were, it sounded like, talking about the way the left assumes that all minorities think and act the same. You've also taken aim very recently at that attitude within conservative circles. I mean, Patrick Brown's campaign, for example, talked about really courting the so-called ethnic vote, as though anyone who is under that banner of ethnic thinks the same way about politics and leadership candidates. Do you feel that conservatives get too hung up in, in identity politics? Because I've heard supporters of yours, for example, that say, well, you know, it would be great if conservatives fielded a minority because then it would deflect against the racism allegation or a woman because it would uh, deflect against the misogyny. Do you feel conservatives get too consumed by this as well? No, it's, it's a real issue. Race is a real issue. Mm. The problem with that we have is when we attribute everything to it. Now, if we know that the liberals are playing identity politics, yes, of course, my candidacy is going to deflect against that because the ridiculous things that they accuse uh, conservatives of are, are false. Many of them are false. And so that's a part of the problem that the media has with me is that they can no longer perpetuate that false narrative. So race is real, racism is real, but the problem is, is that we cannot reduce individuals just to a race. And for a leadership candidate to say, I somehow have proprietary rights over this group of people and I'm gonna pass them on to this group of people as if these individuals are not human beings with identities, with values. I believe that I can reach different segments of people based on, on different values. You reach farmers based on one set of values. You, reach, you may reach another group based on a different set of values, but you can't assume that every farmer thinks alike or every white person thinks alike or every person of color thinks alike. You have in the course of your campaign called out a number of global institutions and treaties that you view as problematic. Most notably we have the, the World Health Organization which I think has been rightfully under a, a microscope lately. Talk to me about what you would do as Prime Minister when it comes to Canada's engagement with multilateral organizations including but not limited to the WHO. 
Well, sovereignty is very important. My sovereignty as a individual is very important. My government needs to respect that. S same with our national sovereignty. That is also very important. I believe that uh, global organizations are encroaching on our sovereignty. And many of the treaties that are being imposed, we later assent to those treaties, and, and then we start to conform our laws to meet those, uh, those treaty parameters. And so that's the problem that I have when we have something like the World Pandemic Treaty that's going to, going to be um, drafted. Uh, the first draft will be presented in August next month. And yet we have not looked at what we have done right and wrong in COVID. We have not formulated our own pandemic response. So how can we sit down at a table with global leaders and say this is how our interests will best be served when we haven't assessed that on our own. That's the problem that I have primarily with the world um, pandemic treaty and the fact that the international health regulations um, that's attached to the to the WHO that those were going to be modified those 13 modifications that seemed to be just being pushed under the carpet earlier I thought it was very important to raise a flag and let civil society know exactly what was going on. But what was going on? What were the issues with those amendments to the IHRs? The issue was that many of those amendments, if they had taken place, it would have been a preemptive treaty. It was almost like grooming us for a tre treaty. And yet those would have taken place outside of the parameters of consultation that you would have when you have a, a, a uh, signage to an international treaty. So the civil society would have been robbed of the opportunity to engage in those amendments. And then potentially when the treaty came about, they would say, well, you know what? We already have these amendments in the regulation. That's why I put my foot down. That's why I sent out a petition. And that's why in two days, we had over 20, 21,000 people signing on to that petition. So do you think then that Canada should withdraw from the World Health Organization? Because this is a discussion that's happened after the former White House, the Trump administration wanted to withdraw the U.S. Do you think that that's something Canada should do? I think Canada should withdraw from any international treaty that affects our sovereignty. But from the organization itself, from the WHO? Well, from the WHO, if it's affecting our sovereignty and if they're not going to respect our sovereign health care rights, then absolutely, yes. What is it that you would like to see as Canada's role on the world stage? Because we all know when Justin Trudeau came in, he gave that famous line, Canada's back, as though Canada was a laughing stock under Harper and then it was back. And I mean, I think most people know that that hasn't worked out exactly as he, he promised it. But what do you want to see as Canada's role? Canada was respected under Stephen Harper internationally. Right now, we are a laughing stock. And you have seen that in the way that our prime minister has been treated. And any, any leader that uses a, a tragedy to divide and for political gain, there is a reckoning and there will be a result. And Canadians are waking up to exactly what has happened. Canadians are going to make sure that they are holding their elected officials more accountable. What and tragedy are you that. referring to? We had COVID. COVID created such trauma in people's lives. We're still recovering from it. There are many people, every day I meet people who've ha who have a story, who cry in my presence, whether they're grown men or grown women crying because of some of the trauma that they've endured because of COVID. And we had a prime minister that capitalized on that. In fact, $650 million was spent on a pandemic election, and we have no fur we're no further along. We've heard rumblings, which, as you know now in Ottawa, are, are very common about anything and everything, that there could be a fall election coming up. And the Conservatives put out a, a tweet last week when this came up that said, you know, Canada doesn't need an election. Canadians don't want an election. The counterpoint to that is that for Conservatives who see what Justin Trudeau is doing, who oppose that, you'd think they'd want to replace him at the first available opportunity. So, the very first available opportunity. So you would be, you would welcome, if you're the leader of September, a fall election. Absolutely, the very first available opportunity to replace him because Canadians are tired. Canadians recognize that the only way forward is a conservative majority so that we can undo some of the damage that has been done by this current uh, leadership. 
we need an election. And if, and if one, the opportunity comes up in the fall, I think that we should jump at it. It would be the best opportunity for our country. You've taken aim at the idea of net zero, which as we know is, is really the backbone of, of, I think, Canada's environmental policy right now. This idea that we have to get to net zero emissions by 2030, 2035, when, whenever each target is it. You wrote your doctoral dissertation on attracting green energy investment. You were specifically looking at, at Sub-Saharan Africa, but a lot of people would look at that and say, well, she's, she's a booster of a lot of the very same things that net zero is really based on. So what is your view on this? They, they, they wouldn't, that means that they didn't understand my PhD thesis because my PhD thesis was actually about representing Canadian corporations and um, working with other countries that were transitioning and wanted, they, they didn't have the grid capacity. They don't have oil and gas like we have. They don't have the third largest accessible oil reserves on the planet. So any source, and they don't have electricity. So any source of electrification is a bonus for them. And when you're close to the equator and your biggest resource is the sun, um, solar panels are very viable. And so Canadian companies that I represented were actually selling that to have countries in sub-Saharan Africa optimize their biggest resource, which is the sun, one of their biggest resources. And just like here, one of our biggest energy resources is oil and gas. And I would do the same for Canada. When you say that you're an environmentalist, but you're against the carbon tax and you're against net zero, what is your view look like if you were to run in a general election campaign trying to court a country's worth of votes what does your environmental platform look like because generally speaking I, I think the liberals and i'd say the media have made it so that the only way you can be an environmentalist is by supporting a carbon tax mm -hmm. what's your response to that when you're going to get that question inevitably well i have a master's of environmental studies and when i was studying the environment the term climate change wasn't even in political spheres at that time. It, was, it wasn't even popular when I did my master's, the environment. And I did it because I, I knew that we have to be good stewards of, of our environment. And I believe that we can develop our natural resources while being good stewards. And net zero is something that I believe is, is, is um, it's capitalizing on fear. And it doesn't, the governmental officials that are using it, they're not even operationalizing it. They're not telling you what it means. It's almost like a boogeyman. And so they can create any policy around it. They will tell you that uh, electric cars are great for the environment and, and has a low carbon footprint. But when you look at the entire life cycle of an electric car and you start off in say an African country with five-year-old children working in cobalt, cobalt or uh, lithium mines, and then you look at the, the disposal of the battery at the end life, and you calculate all that in the carbon footprint, you would have a di very different picture, but they don't do that. But they do do it for, say, something like cattle farming. The, they would calculate the entire life cycle of that cow um, and that piece of steak on that table and they would tell you that that is not environmentally efficient for you to eat beef but they don't do it for other things and when farmers protest and say well why don't I get credit for the sequestration that I'm doing why don't I get credit for the fact that I'm doing uh, crop rotation why don't I get that credit to reduce my my carbon tax that I have to pay to dry my crops there's no answers. So it's a dictatorial approach. And that approach comes because they conjure up fear about what the environment is. They conjure up fear about um, climate change being only man-made when we know it's both natural and man-made. And then they use uh, it to create a revenue stream, a taxation stream. And the bad thing about that is, is that that taxation stream has done nothing to reduce emissions. I care about the environment. I don't want to pay virtue signals with the environment. I want to see real substantive changes that's going to reduce emissions. And I know that farmers have the capacity to do that because their livelihoods depend on it. But the government is just not communicating. They are just 
expecting people to toe the line and not ask questions, and I don't think that that's a productive way to move forward. But emission reduction is the backbone of, of net zero. Now, obviously, net zero is wanting to reduce emissions to zero, at least ostensibly, and I know that there's a lot of debate about whether the idea of offsetting really exists, but, but it's, it's formulated on the idea of reducing emissions. So how does your plan, which you're saying involves wanting to reduce emissions, differ from the Liberal government's plan, with the exception of the carbon tax, what are you going to do? Unless your answer could just be, we'll let farmers and let the market do it, which is perfectly fine. But do you want government to have a role in this emission reduction? I do believe that there are market incentives that can be provided. And that is for things such as innovative technologies, innovative technologies that will actually enhance conservation, reduce um, emissions. And Many farmers implemented those technologies in order to save their farms. And then the government came back and said, no, that's not enough. You need uh, to reduce nitrogen by X amount. And that's the problem that we're seeing now in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. that the target keeps shifting. The goal keeps shifting. What we need is some continuity. We need to have um, metrics that we can measure, that people can question. And it doesn't have to be a one-sided dictatorial approach. What is it that your campaign is about? If you can distill it down into a, a theme, what is it that your message fundamentally is to Conservative members and to Canadians? I think essentially it's about freedom. It's about freedom to be able to be a sovereign nation that we love and that we've built, the freedom to, to work together and unite together, the freedom of individuals to be able to determine their own destiny. And these are things that Canadians feel are being eroded. And so there's an element of hope that people are hoping that leaders will come forward that will be able to stand up to some of the misinformation and the lies that have been used to just divide us, to turn us against each other, to create hatred, and, and really to, for, for politicians to capitalize off of. So I think that if we look at the, the, um, the issue of freedom, we'll see so many aspects of, of, of what we need to do to move forward, freedom to prosper and to develop our natural resources. Dr. Lewis, thank you. Thank you. That was my interview with Leslin Lewis, concluding our Conservative Leadership Series, which uncreatively is our series of Conservative Leadership candidates. So I hope you've enjoyed, and if you've missed any of them, we have them all up at tnc.news. You can see my chats with Roman Babber, Scott Aitchison, with Pierre Polyev, with Jean Charest, and just for posterity and for the heck of it with Patrick Brown, although he is not in the race at this point. But the reason I share that with you is so that you can also, if you've enjoyed it and you think there's some value to this, so that you can head on over to donate.tnc.news and support this. We've had to go around and meet the leadership candidates where they are. So if you can show your support for this project and for the other work that True North is doing, we would mightily appreciate it. In the meantime, that does it for me. We'll be back soon with more of Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. This is The Andrew Lawton Show. Thank you, God bless, and good day to you all. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.